It's time for Supply Chain Now. Broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Hey, on today's show, we're kicking off a new series this week in business history. On this program, we're going to be taking a look at a particular week and then sharing some of the most relevant events from years past. Of course, mostly business focused with a little dab of global supply chain. And occasionally, we might just throw in a good story outside of our primary realm. So join me, will you? on this look back in history to identify some of the most significant leaders, companies, innovations, and perhaps lessons learned in our collective business history. Now, this week in business history for the week of June 14th. Hey, in story one, on June 15th, 1844, Charles Goodyear officially received the patent for vulcanization. So before we dive into Mr. Goodyear's story, let's better understand vulcanization. Rubber in its natural form became very popular in the early 19th century. However, as many rubber plants were built to meet demand, some of the natural rubber's downfalls became widely uh, evident. In the hot summers, rubber melted into a mess. And in the cold New England winters in particular, rubber became hard as a granite rock. Consumers were in uproar. Demand fell off a cliff. Rubber plants, especially in the United States Northeast, were closing left and right. So you enter vulcanization, where a variety of chemicals, especially sulfur, is added to rubber and heated. This process shrinks rubber to a degree while strengthening it and making the rubber harder. Vulcanization essentially makes rubber much more uh, much more resistant to the temperature extremes and other harsh conditions. Interestingly enough to note, the word vulcanization comes from Vulcan, the Roman god of fire and forge. In fact, my dear third grade teacher from Aiken Elementary, Miss Marks, I'm sure is smiling from heaven with that reference. Okay, so let's get back to Mr. Charles Goodyear. Charles Goodyear was born in 1800 in New Haven, Connecticut. After a number of business uh, endeavors and a bout with dyspepsia, Goodyear and his family were struggling. And somewhere in the early 1830s, he became fascinated with one thing, gum elastic, a.k.a. natural rubber. So keep in mind, the first use of natural rubber has been traced back to the indigenous cultures of Mesoamerica. Let me paint that on a map for you. So think central Mexico, moving southeast through Belize, Guatemala, eventually to northern Costa Rica. Back to Charles Goodyear. So he became infatuated with rubber. In particular, he seemed to latch on to one particular application, life preservers. Goodyear was absolutely convinced that rubber life preservers would cut down on the thousands of people that drowned each year worldwide. uh, Scraping by with nothing but whatever he could get from his investors, working on a variety of products beyond life preservers, Goodyear worked on mailbags for the U.S. government, which were ultimately proven to be faulty due to how the rubber uh, rubber fabric fell apart at high temperatures. Times were tough. Goodyear's family suffered dearly. In fact, Charles Goodyear was put in debtor's prison due to a ton of unsecured borrowing, and the price was steep. As it's been reported that six of Goodyear's 12 children died before reaching adulthood. But Goodyear persevered. He was bound and determined to succeed. The countless experiments didn't stop. And there were some breakthroughs. In fact, Goodyear experienced enough success to build a factory or two where they produced a variety of goods, including those life preservers. 
And wouldn't you know it, just as the Goodyear family was settling in somewhat to a degree of success and a new home, disaster struck. This time in the form of a, of a financial crisis that hit the entire United States. Deemed the panic of 1837, it deepened into a depression that shook the entire country. Goodyear lost everything. But as must as most passionate entrepreneurs do, he soldiered on. In 1839, serendipity arrived on the scene, and in an accident in the lab, Goodyear stumbled across the discovery that when sulfur is added to rubber and hits a hot stove, it improves the product, the genesis of vulcanization, which Goodyear would coin. He and his colleague Nathaniel Hayward would go on to receive a patent for this initial discovery, but it wasn't quite perfected. Goodyear would work to perfect the process of vulcanization at a small factory that he and a variety of partners ran in Springfield, Massachusetts. And on June 15, 1844, Charles Goodyear would receive patent number 3633 from the United States. At the top of the patent, it reads, Improvement in India Rubber Fabrics. There would be patents for vulcanization in other countries, court cases involving infringement. Certainly never a dull moment in Charles Goodyear's journey. Many asked him about how many others benefited from all his tireless work, to which Goodyear would write, quote, The advantages of a career in life should not be estimated exclusively by the standard of dollars and cents, as is too often done. Man has just cause for regret when he sows and no one reaps, end quote. This is a very striking quote from Charles Goodyear, when you consider that the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, which had revenues in excess of $14 billion in 2019, and whose famous blimp can be found at any big event across the world, well, that company was actually founded almost 40 years after Charles Goodyear's death by a completely unrelated individual, Mr. Frank Sieberling. All right, from tires to uh, from tires to technology today on This Week in Business History. Story 2, on June 16th, 1911, a company that would eventually become known as IBM is formed in Endicott, New York. International business machine known around the world as IBM and Big Blue is an iconic American company. Although it's been claimed that over 70% of the company's workforce are based outside of the United States. But did you know that perhaps the company never would have been formed if it hadn't taken the U.S. Census team eight years to process census results back near the end of the 19th century? That's right. Herman Hollerith was a census worker that was determined to find a better way to cope with the endless data that was produced and had to be accounted for as part of the census approach. Hollerith would ultimately invent the punched card tabulate machine, which was patented in 1844. The machine was used in the 1890 census, which despite all the population gains and the sheer increase in data from the 1880 census, the tabulate machine helped cut down process time from eight years to six years. He'd also form, Mr. Hollerith, would form the Tabulating Machine Company in 1896. Despite the company's potential, things weren't quite cracking for Herman and the team. Thus, in 1911, four corporations were amalgamated to form a new company, the Computing Tabulating Recording Company, which would be referred to as CTR. This huge business deal was orchestrated by Charles Ranlett, Flint, uh, Charles Ranlett Flint, the pride of Thomaston, Maine. Now, Flint was uniquely talented in the art of the deal. In fact, he earned the nickname Father of Trusts. Prior to shepherding the formation of CTR in 1911, Flint had bundled several companies together to form U.S. Rubber, which still exists today. You may know U.S. Rubber as Uniroyal, a subsidiary of the French tire maker Michelin, at least here in North America and parts of South America. But back at the Computing 
tabulating recording company, Charles Flint was struggling to lead CTR and its various components. Keep in mind, though, these components had tons of potential. They included the first time clock, the first time card recorder, the newly invented computing scale, and of course, the before mentioned punched card data processing equipment. So what is an investor to do? Bring in the adult supervision, perhaps, as my dear friend Greg White likes to say. That's right, White. Flint hired Thomas J. Watson, who had a wide variety of experience. He had sold organs and pianos. Watson had sold sewing machines. He taught school for exactly one day. Must not have been for him. Thomas J. Watson had even opened a butcher shop where he had gotten to really know one of the tools of his trade, the cash drawer. Yes, just just prior to being hired by CTR, Watson had a ton of success with National Cash Register. You might know it better as NCR. Watson had gotten familiar with his cash register, where he used to ring up his butcher shop customers. So much so where he chose to start selling the devices himself. And he did well, really well, maybe too well. In 1912, NCR was, cha- uh, was charged with the Sherman Antitrust Act. Watson and 26 other NCR employees were convicted and sentenced to one year in jail. However, these convictions were overturned in 1915. Thus, while the case was being appealed, Watson was available to start with the computing tabulating recording company directly. Charles Flint hired Thomas J. Watson on May 1, 2014 as general manager at CTR. In 1914, the company would earn revenues of about $9 million. They had 1,346 employees and 700 shareholders. In 1956, the year Thomas J. Watson stepped down as CEO, IBM would have $892 million in revenue and over 72,000 employees. Needless to say, Watson made a legendary impact on CTR. In fact, the vast growth of the business by the 1920s necessitated a name change. Gone was Computing Tabulating Recording Company, and in, and in its place, the legendary international business machines dubbed around the world as IBM, of course. But the growth didn't go without its controversy. Still to this day, Thomas J. Watson's dealings with Nazi Germany have been criticized and investigated. In 2001, author Edwin Black published a book that made many waves globally. It was entitled, quote, IBM and the Holocaust, the strategic alliance between Nazi Germany and America's most powerful corporation, end quote. To be fair now, during World War II, IBM doubled down on its support for the U.S. government and the Allied war effort. For example, IBM's radio-type product was a significant communications contribution to the U.S. war effort, and the product received its first most extensive use with the Allied military forces in World War II. IBM's steady rise and innovative contributions to global business continued throughout the second half of the 20th century. Think of Artificial intelligence, modern typewriters, mainframe computers, magnetic, magnetic strip, um, <laughs> magnetic stripe cards. Yep, you guessed it. The one we've been purchasing things with for years, and IBM or did that. Fortran, the scientific programming language, personal computers, and so much more. Headquartered today in Armonk, New York. IBM operates in almost 200 countries worldwide. Arvind Krishna was appointed CEO in January 2020. Krishna was a major leader in the IBM acquisition of innovative technology firm Red Hat in 2018. Perhaps one of the greatest contributions to business and global supply chain is all the former IBMers that have left the company and gone on to do even bigger things, such as I, uh Apple CEO Tim Cook, Gartner founder Gideon Gartner, Patricia Roberts Harris, the first African American woman to serve in the U.S. cabinet, and Canadian astronaut and Governor General Julie Payette. 
All right, we're going to wrap up today's episode with a few other important events from years past in This Week in Business History. On June 20th, 1840, Samuel F. B. Morse, the pride of Charlestown, Massachusetts, and an incredibly talented artist, by the way, received the patent for Morse Code. On June 16, 1903, Ford Motor Co- uh, Corporation is founded in Detroit, Michigan. This was Ford's second car company. His first was the Henry Ford Company, founded in 1901. Ford left that company, along with his name, in 1902. The Henry Ford Company, as it were, would go on to be known as the Cadillac Motor Company, which is still alive and well, and interestingly enough, part of General Motors, the primary Ford competitor. On June 15, 1919, the first nonstop transatlantic flight was made by John Alcock and Arthur Brown. The duo was successful about 10 years prior to Charles Lindbergh's famous solo feat. On June 18, 1923, long before Uber or Lyft, the first Checker taxi cab rolled off the assembly line in Kalamazoo, Michigan. At its peak, the company would make 5,000 taxi cabs a year. And as times changed, so did Checker Cab Manufacturing Company's fortunes. Unfortunately, it closed in 2009, shortly after declaring bankruptcy. On June 18, 1928, Amelia Earhart, the pride of Atchison, Kansas, became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean as a passenger. Of course, she'd later famously pilot a nonstop solo transatlantic flight in 1932. Five years later, while attempting to make a flight around the world, the famous pioneer and challenger of the status quo would disappear, along with her Lockheed Model 10E Electra and navigator Fred Noonan. On June 16, 1963, Soviet cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova would become the first woman in space as part of the Vostok 6 mission. On June 20, 1963, on the heels of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a direct communications link was installed between Washington, D.C. and Moscow. It was not a red telephone, as popular culture may imply, but initially it was a teletype mission linking specifically the Kremlin with the Pentagon, not the White House. Meant to eliminate the diplomatic delays and to avert any misinterpretations that could lead to a deadly nuclear exchange between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Finally, and most importantly, on June 19, 1964, the U.S. Senate finally passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The U.S. House had approved this landmark legislation back in February, several months prior of 1964. It got much uh, trickier, by the way, in the Senate. Ultimately, it had to overcome a robust filibuster. A filibuster, a political maneuver designed to obstruct action being taken by essentially continued talking and grandstanding. Nevertheless, the bill passed the U.S. Senate and was signed into law on July 2nd, 1964, by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. So a pretty special week in business and in general, if you ask me at least. I hope you've enjoyed this first edition of This Week in Business History here on Supply Chain Now. You know, be sure to check out our wide variety of industry thought leadership, webinars, live streams, podcasts, you name it, other special events at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. On behalf of the entire team here at Supply Chain Now, this is Scott Luton wishing all of our listeners nothing but the best. Hey, do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. 